Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 352. Hysterectomy, how to choose the best procedure for you. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So you are a gynecologist. You've spent most of your productive professional life as a gynecologist, and you've done a lot of hysterectomies. Mm -hmm. And in our conversations, you've shared with me that there are controversies among doctors about when, why, and how to do hysterectomies and how far to go with a hysterectomy and what's the best way cosmetically to make one look. And I mean, there's just a lot to, to talk about. <laughs> there is. And it, it's a subject that, as a male, I know absolutely nothing about. That's okay. We'll teach you something today. Oh, well, I hope so. Please <laughs> tell me. So, so what is a hysterectomy? <clears throat> The definition of hysterectomy is is that your uterus and only your uterus includes your cervix. Your uterus is being taken out. That's a total hysterectomy. Okay? Okay. A super cervical hysterectomy is one where your uterus above the cervix is taken out. And then you can have a total hysterectomy which is ovaries and uterus and tubes. So you so see the three different kinds then. Right. Three different and what's types. the driving factor on how you decide which kind you need? Well, it used to be, let me give you a little history. Right. It used to be that when we talked to patients, we said, you need a history hysterectomy because you have endometriosis or you've got a huge fibroid uterus. Usually the patient already knew what her symptoms were and that you've been struggling to control the symptoms with something non-surgical. So usually my patients knew why they needed a hysterectomy but they didn't know exactly what that meant for them. So they know they have a fibroid uterus. How do they know that? Well, because generally you start, this whole thing starts by going to the doctor and saying, I have pain or I have pressure or I'm starting to lose urine or I'm bleeding all the time or I've, I've got this pregnant looking uterus now or belly. What is that? Swollen and hard. And swollen and hard. That would be yeah. like huge fibroids. Okay. So they go to the doctor with something like that. And then usually we try things that are medically, medical treatments for this. Trying to shrink fibroids with like Arimidex or, or Lupron or, I mean, using medicines right. to solve the problem. Instead okay? of pr prior to surgery. You don't prior just go to, to surgery. surgery. You don't just go, oh, I've got this. Let's just go to surgery. Unless the only exception to that is if you have uh, an ovarian mass that looks like cancer, I've been known to diagnose and treat within the same week because there's a time element there for cancer for cancer as always yeah the right. earlier the better that's right and and in that kind of cancer it can you can go from a stage one to a stage two three two or three pretty quickly so that's something that you have to rush but other than that usually a patient and a doctor together have been working through this problem for months or years and it gets better and then it gets worse and it gets better and it gets worse so at that point when it's finally to the point where the medicine doesn't work or they've tried everything and nothing works okay then you say to your patient i don't know i mean this is why hysterectomies are done they it's it used to be different but now it's you have this problem the only way we can fix it is to take out the uterus or to take out the uterus and cervix or to take out the uterus cervix and ovaries so that stops the problem whatever the problem may be and you may not know that until you do a biopsy to, to say well this was I mean, you'll know if it's a fibrous tumor there yes if it's a fibrous tumor we don't biopsy those we ultrasound them uh -huh. and in the worst case scenario you would do an mri but but usually an ultrasound is enough uh -huh. and no biopsy is necessary because fibroids are usually benign right and so in that case you don't need a biopsy there's there's so but many different reasons to have a hysterectomy that means not cancerous okay so but if you're having many people have postmenopausal bleeding they need a biopsy of their uterus of the inside of their uterus the that's done in the office okay and so when we 
we do that, we get a pathology report, we sit down with the patient and say, it's benign, we have these options, or it's cancer, and now we have to go to right. surgery. And if it's benign, you have these options. The path report would tell you what? It's a hormone imbalance? or It could. It's a, a too thick of a lining? It can tell too- you it's too thick or too much estrogen or not enough progesterone or... Um, or that you've been bleeding for so long, it's all broken down, and and that's that means the pa- the pathology of the lining of the uterus looks um, it doesn't look uniform. It it looks like it's all kind of like somebody threw a bomb into it, but it's not cancerous. Right. It's just just a system. It's not normal, and the uterus is just bleeding mm-hmm. and dripping or whatever you want to call it. Right. This hysterectomy is the one surgery where. After you've had your kids, you can lose an organ and, and, I mean, the uterus itself, and it really isn't going to affect you all that much down the line because you don't need your womb. Truly, you don't need your womb after you've had your children. Just the womb part. (laughs) Just the uterus part. Now, ovaries and cervix are different different choices, but provide different complications and different problems. But if you take out the womb... What would be the advantage or reason to keep the ovaries? I mean, there's nothing that can happen there. Well, there, there is. Other than the hormonal balances and things that. Well, if you're premenopausal, so we kind of we kind of divide this up and we say, if you're premenopausal, then taking out the ovaries means we're going to sh- shut down all your hormone production. Okay. And nowadays, some doctors don't replace it, and we'll go over that. Right. But, and. And you're going to have to be on hormones the rest of your life and earlier than you would have if you went through menopause naturally. Okay, so that's what you have to talk to premenopausal patients about. But postmenopausal patients, they may already be on hormones or they may already... It's two really separate conversations. It is. I mean, they're like two worlds apart. It is. It is. But the three questions, if you're a patient that, Mm -hmm. that you want to answer yourself is... You want to answer, should my ovaries come out? Right. Then you should ask, you should also think about, should my cervix come out or should my cervix stay and the reasons behind staying or taking it out? And then you also should ask, how how should this be done? Should this procedure be done through, or can it be done through the vagina? And what does that mean? Can it be done through the abdominal wall with an incision? Or is that that's kind of the last resort nowadays? Or can it be done with a laparoscope, where we put in little tiny holes and work with these little chopstick instruments? Yeah. And uh, work through uh, cameras with a little light on the end of them, so you can see what you're doing. Right. And we we kind of distend the belly. Your you belly put gas in. Put gas in it, away. and that shows us a better view right. than if you don't have a gas in there. You can't really do it. You have right. to distend that and then put patients on their head basically flip them in. it's called Trendelenburg when you put your head lower than your feet so that all the bowel goes up towards your head right. and we have room to work out of the way. if you can't stand if for some medical reason you can't be on your head yeah. for that long high blood pressure stroke some you know other cardiovascular problems uh-huh. then we really can't do laparoscopes or even the latest most interesting kind of hysterectomy which i never did uh-huh. is called a da vinci hysterectomy which is done with you behind a screen and all of these little instruments put into the abdomen and then you use a joystick to do the surgery you being the doctor you being the doctor i right. be, i being the doctor would <laughs> if i were doing that procedure yeah would be using like you're distant from the patient you're using the joystick to to basically do your surgery they find that to be more delicate and not as, I mean, not as um, traumatic to the tissue because they're, they've got these instruments that are just working right. very nicely through a, a computer. Right. So that's, that's one of those procedures that is optional and it only has little tiny incisions. So you have to, you have to sit down with your patient okay, so, but this is after and the, make the these first decisions. decision is, do you need to take your womb out? Right. Does and, the hysterectomy and, have to be done? And we may not necessarily know why specifically, <clears throat> but we know from your symptoms this needs to be done. Right. And and let me let me go back in history a little bit. Okay. 
because most people don't like update their knowledge of hysterectomy <laughs> all the time. They, they remember what their mother said or what somebody said 20 years ago or right. 10 years ago, but it's all changed. So what we used to do, I was in a Catholic hospital mm -hmm. when I trained, so that's 40 years ago. And um, the Pope didn't allow birth control. So women didn't get, we did not perform tubal ligations. And for them to have birth control, many women came in because their doctor said, not that you have a disease, but you shouldn't have any more children. It's uh -huh. not, it's dangerous for you. Or financially, you tell the doctor, I can't have any more children. I just can't. And so the only answer then that was acceptable to the church was a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. So I took out probably a thousand teeny tiny little normal uteruses, okay? That was for birth control. We don't do that anymore. Right. But at the time, that was all we had. So that was acceptable. I That brought on an onslaught of people saying, you're doing hysterectomies for no reason. Right. The pathology report comes back as normal. Every, the symptoms weren't bad enough for a hysterectomy. So then there was a, a microscope on doctors doing this. So in some ways it this. was a discretionary procedure at that time. At that time. The same way a man would get a, a vasectomy because mm -hmm. he didn't want to have any more children. Not because he, there's a medical Right, but necessity. that wasn't acceptable then either. No, no, I understand it, but it's a comparable uh, volitional choice. It is. At that point is what mm -hmm. you were saying. But they moved away from that. But, but the doctor would work in concert with the patient sure. saying kind of under our breath, which I wasn't the one making the decision in those right. cases, but I was the one assisting. They'd say, well, you know, we're just doing, uh, but they write down heavy bleeding or something right. like that. Right. So, so that's where we started. Then insurance companies started getting all excited about too many hysterectomies. We've got to save money. We've got, you know, this is, this is a terrible thing. You're doing too many. And then over time, we then backed up because they wouldn't pay for a hysterectomy right. um, for the patient to have her insurance cover it. We had to prove we were doing it for a disease. Right. And then we got to the point where we then said, okay, so now we're taking out uteruses only for disease and we're teaching our, our residents to take out really big uteruses. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that we're just taking out little tiny uteruses. So now we have more challenge. Lots of big uteruses that are fibroid or are just enlarged and bleed a lot. There are, fi there are uh, uteruses that bleed and aren't enlarged, but just you can't get them to stop bleeding. They've either because they've had ch lots of kids or miscarriages, but still pregnancies that have right. invaded the uterine wall, they just get spongy. It's called adenomyosis. Then sometimes somebody needs a hysterectomy for... Um, <clears throat> A disease not of the uterus itself but of the ovary and that's where we get into choices about do we leave ovaries do we keep ovaries so let's go over the ovarian question because we've gotten past the history of why we have sure. so much attention on unnecessary hysterectomies so did, we're going to take out the uterus then we're going to decide whether or not we're going to take out the ovaries that's right. one of the three questions that you should discuss if your doctor says well, we need to take your uterus out right what about my ovaries right and what kind of procedure and what and about my cervix? About the cervix but let's do the ovaries, so the first. ovaries first so so if you are if you have something that the doctor thinks is cancer of the ovary you have a mass you have a ca125 test that says it's high so you might have cancer mm -hmm. they're going in specifically because of something wrong with the ovary we sit down with patients and we say, okay, you may have cancer. If you have cancer while I'm in there, I have to take out both ovaries. If it's ovarian cancer, I have to take out both ovaries and the uterus because the uterus is, is, I mean, we're in there. We might as well take the uterus out. It doesn't do much for us without ovaries. So, and you're not going to have babies anymore and you have no more hormones. It makes giving hormones easier. So sometimes the decisions made, we have to take the ovaries out even before it's made that we have to take the uterus out. Right. That's so, true. Could, but but as long as you're in there, as long as you're going to take the ovaries out, you need to take the uterus anyway. Right. Because otherwise we're giving somebody estrogen and, and then we have to give them progesterone with it. And then we have bleeding issues even without ovaries. Right. But in, in ovarian cancer, the uterus has to go out. It has to be removed. Right. They yeah. find that there might be extension there. And, and uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons you have to have a hysterectomy, you have to have the ovaries out right. with the hysterectomy. Then um, the other reason that you have to have your ovaries out that would be 
definite, definite. And I'm not looking at my notes. I'm just trying to keep, <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking because I don't know what I'm talking about next, but I just want to make sure I'm, I'm Covered. not missing anything. Right. So um, if you have endometriosis, right. endometriosis is little implants of, of tissue that looks a lot like what's inside the uterus and bleeds every month when you're cycling. That tissue's in the wrong place. We call it ectopic. It's it's not an ectopic pregnancy, but ectopic tissue that in, is inside your belly. And every month when you bleed from the uterus, as long as you're cycling, you bleed into your abdomen and it hurts and it scars and it damages your pelvis and your bowel. So it's something that we use different medicines for. And when we find that we can't stop it or slow it down or shut it down, we, we advise patients that they need to have their ovaries out and their uterus, but mostly because the ovaries and the way the ovaries cycle cause the endometriosis to bleed and scar. So to save the patient- Does, does it generate these little tissue samples? It stimulates them. Stimulates. The ovaries right. and the, not just estrogen, if you were on just estrogen or just progesterone and you took it same thing every day, it would not cause the, and, and we give those hormones, so it would there. not cause there, that. There are flaws in, in the mechanics of your body mm -hmm. that then get stimulated by the same hormones that the ovaries generate. Right. So if you take the ovaries out, they don't reduce, they don't uh, release the stimulating hormones. Right, and it has and to so be then you cycling stop hormones. Cycling hormones. So, so then you stop bleeding. And so but you don't the bleed inside. the tissues are still there. They die. They die without that cycling hormone. Okay. All right. So the little the little implants, we try to get all of them out, but it's almost impossible in most sure. cases when we're doing a hysterectomy. But we those implants have to be taken out uh, or has, have to die after surgery. So we don't cycle anybody on their hormones for quite a while after surgery. Those patients can, can be treated with testosterone right away. But usually we give them just a tiny bit of estrogen to stop hot flashes uh -huh. afterwards. But this is, this is the other reason that you should have your ovaries out. If you leave one in and you take out the uterus and one ovary that might be affected and you have endometriosis, you're gonna have the same symptoms over again. You have a, you're a setup for another surgery. So if you have endometriosis, you take both of them out. Right. But if you don't have endometriosis, you have an option of leaving one in if it's right. not diseased. Yes, you do. So and, and you would do that because you could then still have babies. Well, if you're premenopausal uh, and you have an ovarian mass and it is not cancer and it is not endometriosis, right. then we can go in and take that mass out on one side. And I mean, all, I did all this personally. I was sure. the patient, so yeah. I had all of these things. And you can have it have the ovary out through a laparoscope or through, a his, or through an incision, and then they close you up and the other ovary takes over. Uh -huh. So the other ovary starts cycling. So, so then- So you might still be able to get pregnant yes. if you have the wound. Right. But if you're taking out the uterus, there's a reason to leave the ovary because you might still need those hormones that it releases. Right. Okay. Right. So exactly right. if it's healthy, right. you want to keep it. That's right. So if it's healthy, you want to keep it and, and accept for, there's always an accept for, have you noticed that? There's always an accept for, if you have a family history of ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. Or if you have BRCA one or two genetics that you've had done, right. then then and only then the ovaries really should come out because you have a very high risk compared to the normal population right. of getting ovarian or ovarian cancer or breast cancers fed by the ovaries. So then it's just preventative because you know right. the odds are higher for right. this person. Yes, and you, that's you, you Angelina Jolie. You discussed that with them. That was Angelina Jolie. And you, she and had you breasts. discussed it with them and they make that decision. Right. That's they, not, at that point, a medical decision of necessity. Right. It's a, it's a preventative procedure for a greater risk down the road. That's true. Okay. Exactly right. And the doctor says, these are, these are my... These are the pros and cons right. for your particular case. And here's what I recommend. And here's what I recommend. But you have to decide. And that's, and that's something you have to discuss with your doctor. And even today, now that I'm doing just hormones, I have patients that come in and say, well, I talked, to, I talked this over with my doctor, but since you're doing my hormones, I want to know what the implication is. Right. And so we go over all of this and decide what that, the situation of that particular patient is. It's not a blanket decision. I always see these articles in women's magazines. Don't have your ovaries out. Right. Well, 
there are circumstances where you have to. Right. I mean, I had mine out. Medical necessity. And I, I had to have mine out or I would still be in pain, doubled over and miserable. You know, it. I mean, not still, probably I'm too old for that, but I would have been in pain and doubled over and miserable until yeah. menopause. Right. So it is something where it's not an all or none. We have to make a specific decision for you. It's a judgment you. call between the professionals who can tell you what the odds are. Right. And what they recommend and why. Mm-hmm. And yourself. Yes. And, and sometimes maybe your religion uh, that you have to you have to weigh all these factors. Right. You should have so, a voice in your care too. Uh, absolutely. You shouldn't just go to a doctor who paternalistically pats your head or pats your hand and says, "Oh, honey, I'll take care of it. I'll just do what you need." Right. How does he know what you need, right. or she know what you? Okay. You rarely so, do women do that. So we're talking about having hysterectomy mm-hmm. and the reasons why a woman might have one and what the history has been. Mm-hmm. We're talking about. Uh, removing the ovaries is, is that a oophorectomy? Oophorectomy is what an it's oophorectomy called. Oophorectomy, and goes in tandem with a hysterectomy very often. Very often, most of the time. What we uh, ha- and we talked about endometriosis. Right. What we haven't talked about is a cervical hysterectomy. Super cervical. Super cervical. Where we leave the cervix which, in place. Which we're going to talk about the next time because it's a lot more complicated than some of this other stuff we're talking about for reasons <laughs> that we'll get into. And so, also choosing choosing the procedure that's the and best. This, which are the three questions, or all the three questions need to be answered, but why you need to ask them mm-hmm. and what the options become as you discuss those. And we want you to be informed so you can talk to your doctor and know what you're talking about so that you don't ask for something that's outrageous and that would be terrible for you but then again you you can work with your doctor and understand what he or she is saying right so we will talk about the rest of the things that you need to talk to your doctor about if you're planning on having a hysterectomy thank you for listening email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the biobalance healthcast on itunes and on youtube For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.